right? And there's like an info inferiors command that you can list. And I guess in theory you can actually have multiple inferiors, although I've never done it. So I guess in theory you can attach to multiple processes. But that's not what I end up doing usually. Uh, GDB also has an abstraction for what, what I'll call a GDB architecture. You can think of it as a given uh, ABI. Um, and there's a struct GDB arc I'll get to in a second. Um, but for example, the FreeBSD AMD64 ELF process would be one example of a GDB architecture or a NetBSD AMD64 ELF, or a Linux i386, those are all different ABIs. And a GDB architecture is kind of the class, if you will, that they use to how they define ABI-specific behavior. Um, and the last thing that I'll kind of, thing I'll talk about is what GDB refers to as a target. Now, oftentimes when we're talking about debuggers, we would use target in the way that GDB kind of uses inferior. Right, so that's the thing we're targeting that we're talking to. Um, but the actual target in the GDB in terms of implementation is a, is a way to interface with a given inferior. So whether you're talking to it over a remote or whether you're using a specific native target, for example, using ptrace on FreeBSD or procfs on a given operating system. So that's kind of the targets are the, the set of operations that you can apply to an inferior while it's running. And a GDB architecture kind of defines properties about the inferior, if that makes sense. So a little bit more about architectures and targets. Um, so each architecture is defined by an instance of a struct GDB arc, which has a whole bunch of different function pointers and other data members inside of it. Um, <coughs> many times you'll have a given target that will want to use architecture-specific behavior. So for example, in GDB there's a single target to read core files and to handle core files and it knows to go talk to libbfd to go read memory out of a core file that corresponds to virtual addresses for something. Um, but there are also parts of core files that are different for, for different platforms. So for example, how does your operating system save the set of registers and the list of threads? How is that saved? That kind of varies per ABI. So there tend to be hooks in your ABI for things like that, such as extracting the registers out of a core file. Uh, one other thing that we have in the GDB arc is a pointer to a whole other little class structure, if you will. Uh, it's kind of a mini target for how do you handle shared libraries on your ABI. Um, so in many Unix systems, there's like a, a system five R4 shared library, tar shared library target that handles ELF shared libraries um, that a lot of systems use, for example. Uh, but perhaps at the end, you'll see why it matters that you can kind of prob that independently. Another thing that's commonly found in GDB architectures are the bits for how do you unwind a signal frame. Uh, often, uh, many of the architectures I've looked at in GDB, you are sniffing some, something in the instruction stream, you're looking for a specific pattern of instructions, a signal, a signal frame, and that you then can know, based on your stack, where to go find your SIG context, and then fetch all the registers in a given signal out of that. So, when you're looking inside a checkout of GDB, all these little struct ADB arcs, the ABIs, they're defined in these tdep.c files. All right, so, uh, and just to give a couple of examples and maybe help a little bit with the naming convention, there's an fbsd-tdep.c that has routines that are shared by all the various different FreeBSD ABIs, so things that are machine independent. Um, for example, I think there's bits in there to handle core file notes that write into a core file that aren't architecture specific, so the registers are architecture specific. Um, but things like point out the thread names that are associated with a given thread, which is written into a core file note, that goes in this file. Um, then we have AMD64 FBSD-tdep.c, and that gives a more architecture-specific ABI. So that's all the bits that are specific to both FreeBSD and AMD64 live in this particular file. And, and in the most specific files, like AMD64 FBSD tdep, they're going to actually define um, not quite a struct GDB arc, but a method to initialize one uh, that will call and either use functions directly or call a helper function inside the kind of more generic tdep.c file to handle things that are architecture independent but FreeBSD specific. Now the way GDB works is when you pull up a given executable, it has a list of what I call ABI sniffers. So it's like a very simple, like a set of, you could think of it as a linked list of little structures that have a probe function, which you know, just like device drivers and lots of other things, 
um, that will look at the binary and, and, and return some kind of value of if they're the best, how well they match against the binary. And so the way you, an ABI gets associated with a given file when you open it is the sniffers run and the best sniffer wins and gets attached to the binary. And that's going to define what architecture specific and OS specific things are going to do. So when you have a cross debugger, you have a bunch of different sniffers all compiled in the same binary. And keying off properties of the binary is how we'd pick which ABI and this, therefore which architecture we're going to be debugging against. Um, and so in a sniffer, you have uh, a way to kind of uh, probe or match on a binary. And then you have an arbitrary pointer to a function. Uh, so it's an initialization routine. Um, so I said before, in like AMD64, FBC, I don't have a struct GDB arc like you might do, for example, in FreeBSD, if you have a character device, you'll have a static struct CDEV switch and you explicitly lay out the members of that structure and set the function pointers to the methods you want. In GDB, you don't define the global static thing that you return. Instead, your initialization routine is called with kind of a blank struct GDB arc or with a GDB arc that's pre-filled to kind of the default values and you overwrite fields um, in the structure with the more specific behavior you want to add. So for example, an FBC tdap.c, I think we have a function that kind of sets the FreeBSD machine independent methods. And so the AMD64 specific initialization routine calls the FreeBSD generic routine and then that returns, it calls an AMD64 routine that kind of sets generic AMD64 OS independent methods. And then it sets explicitly the specific things such as the signal context helper variables for handling FreeBSD AMD64. Any questions on targets or architecture so far? All right. So the last thing I want to talk about in GDB are targets. And so targets are classes for when we have an inferior we want to talk to, what are the set of operations we do to an inferior? Um, so things like I want to read and write memory inside the inferior. So for example, with ptrace, we're going to use something like ptreadd or ptio on FreeBSD to do the read and write. On a core file, we're going to use um, the ELF headers to know which part of the core file corresponds to the virtual address we care about, and we'll go read the bits out of the core file. Um, things like manipulating registers, so actually fetching the values of the current registers at the state and time, or setting them if you're not doing a core file. How do we find threads that are inside a given inferior? Um, and if you're doing native debugging, so it's not a core dump, how do I uh, set up state and I want to wait until a new event shows up that I care about? Right, which in ptrace land, that would be equivalent to um, doing a PT continue to resume and then actually calling wait for something to happen. The other thing about targets is in GDB, they have a kind of, there's a, an, a very explicit actually stack or layer of, of targets. And targets can choose to defer operations further down the stack. Um, so one common way this is done is if, you're, if your operating system supports libthreadDB, you may have a specific target to handle threading that just talks to libthreadDB, but when it wants to fetch registers from a kernel thread using LWP, it might pass that request down to the lower level, which will then use ptrace to actually do that. So it allows you to stack um, more specific behavior on top of less in, in various ways. Or for example, um, some upper layer uh, may choose to, well, for I guess I want another example. Uh, when you first load up a binary, uh, there's a target that just knows how to talk to an executable. And it can read and write memory from the executable directly if you don't have a core file or a process attached to yet. But then when you start debugging a process or you, start, or you open a core file, we push a new target on top of the kind of base exec executable file uh, target that will intercept all the memory requests and use either ptrace or examining the core file and it never actually gets down to the binary. But when you have a binary alone, you can look at the initialized, like the the value of the variables before the process runs and stuff because they fall down to the bottom target. So I have a couple of pictures of that. So simplified pictures. So um, for example, when we're examining a core file, we have an exec file target. I think that's actually the name of the structure almost. Um, and it has the associated variable exec BFD, which is this global variable that points to the BFD object um, for the file you're examining. So I should say that GDB uses libbfd from binutils to handle all the different executables it talks to. Right? And they have a kind of BFD object that you can use, that you use to do file operations and look up sections and things. Uh, and then when you have a, a core dump, we push a core target on top of the exec 
target. And the core target has an associated core BFD object. So when the core file is present and a memory request comes in, it's going to just head over to the core BFD in effect to fetch that memory. Whereas if the core file were not there, um, we would use the exec file target, which would use the associated exec BFD to fetch memory. And similarly when we're running, um, so when you're actually running a process, GDB calls that a native target. That's even though there's lots of different native targets, that's kind of the generic name for those. So for example, a native target, when a memory request comes in, um, we'll use ptrace and procfs kind of in place of what would have been the core BFD when we're using a core target. All right, let's see. I guess I actually said that. So a native target you get when you call run or if you attach to an existing process. And um, more about file names and the conventions of file names. So native targets are kind of defined in two sets of files. There are these inf-star.c files. Uh, there's like an inf-child.c, which is, you could think of as the base class of all native targets. There's an inf-ptrace.c, which is kind of builds on the child base class and adds ptrace specific methods that are mostly OS independent. And then you have these nat.c files. And the nat.c files are kind of structured similar to the tdep files. So for example, let's see if it's on the next slide. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> um, so I said the first of the two things. So an example of a nat.c file is there's an fbsd nat.c, which has things that are FreeBSD specific, but are platform independent that you will want to do against their processor debugging. Um, so for example, if there are FreeBSD specific ptrace methods you want to do that are not specific to a given architecture, they go in this file. Um, many of the things I'll talk about in a little bit, that's where they, that are um, for debugging threads and fork following and stuff, they all end up in here because they're not specific to a given architecture. And that way there's just one copy of it and all the different architectures share them. Um, one thing about the BSD targets, and it's kind of unique to the BSD targets inside of GDB, is they often have part of their native code shared in what I call a pan BSD file. So well, we have an AMD64 BSD.nat or dash nat.c file that actually has the ptrace methods to handle fetching and, and setting registers because that interface is the same across all the different BSD operating systems. And so they share that code. Um, unlike the tdep files where this is all OS specific. And then we have an AMD64 FBSD nat.c um, which uses methods from the, the, comma, comma, or the common pan BSD as well as that FBSD nat.c file. Um, and, and uses those all together to build a target that represents live debugging of a running process on FreeBSD AMD64. So any questions about any of that? At least hopefully you've got the target in your head and you kind of know which, if you go look in GDB and you understand now what the, the NAT files mean in TDEP if you didn't before. I hope. <laughs> okay. This is the type of stuff just I've figured out at least I've found helpful. All right. So for the next part, I want to talk about two different things uh, I've added-ish um, to GDB um, over the last two years, uh, or the last year, I guess. Uh, and one of them, I even also added some bits to the kernel to make it work a little better. So the first I want to talk about is fork following, uh, which shipped in GDB 7.10. And in GDB 7.11, uh, GDB actually shipped with a native uh, thread target that only talks to LWPs. So, first of all, who knows what fork following is? Right, yeah. In fact, I remember when I worked at Yahoo a while ago, maybe eight or nine years ago, I had a bug that I didn't take, which was fix follow fork mode on FreeBSD. Well, I did it this year. So, <laughs> what are some things that we need that GDB requires a native target to provide on fork following? And it is native target specific, right? You don't follow forks in a core dump because nothing's running. You have to actually be executing fork for this to matter and make sense. So one thing we need is when a new child process of a trace process created, we need to stop the child process before it starts executing anything, okay? Um, in addition to that, we need a way to inform the debugger or the tracer about fork when it happens. So we need to post an explicit event that tells the debugger it's happened. Um, and ideally, we actually need to tell it what our new child process is so it can go to go find this process and stop and waiting for a debugger to tell it to continue. 
Um, in theory, you could try to handle the latter request by stopping every single fork system call and exit and looking and, and looking at the return value and figuring out the PID from that way. But that's kind of ugly because then you have to have an architecture specific callback to fetch the return value that you can use. Um, and it also doesn't solve the first problem. Now I'm gonna do a little segue and we'll come back to fork following. So one of the requests that FreeBSD has that was added several years ago for thread debugging um, is this ptrace request called ptlwp info. So typically with ptrace, uh, you get not a lot of detailed information about a thread when it stops. You call wait and you find out you stopped, either because of a trap or a signal. And that's kind of all you find out from wait. So you don't really get a lot more details from wait aside from that. Um, even in struct sig info, it's not really detailed. It's, it may tell you the core dump, there's a bit for that, but there's not a lot of detailed information about why you trapped in particular if it's not due to a signal. So PT and different OSs do this in different ways. I think of all the ones I'm aware of, I think we all have a different way of doing this, unfortunately. Um, but PTLWP info is a request that FreeBSD has to request more detailed state about a thread. Why did you stop? What, what are you currently doing? What are, are there other auxiliary details about why you're stopped? Um, uh, one thing about PTLWP info is if you have a multi-threaded process and one of your given threads triggers a stop, um, all we get from wait is the PID. So we know your process stopped for some reason. We don't know which thread in your process stopped, we just know a, your process stopped. So one of the things about PTLWP info, you can give it a specific thread ID, or an LWP ID, I should say, to get information about a specific thread you're curious about, or you can give it a PID. And if you give it a PID, it will return the structure describing the thread that caused the stop. That way, you, that's how you figure out which thread actually hit a breakpoint or did something. That's how I know which thread I actually care about. The way this information is communicated back is we have a struct ptrace LWP info. And when you call this ptrace command, you basically give a pointer to the struct and it populates it with information about the thread. I'm not gonna go over all of it here, but it's actually documented in the ptrace man page. A couple things I will talk about at the moment. Um, one of the fields is this PL LWP ID, which tells you the thread ID of the thread you just asked for. Um, this goes back to the case when you ask, you, you request the current thread for a PID, you put in a PID to ptrace, and this is what you get out, and you can read the actual thread that stopped from that member. There's also a PL flags member, which is a bitmap of different flags, which tells you what type of events caused the stop. The two flags I'll mention here, um, we have a flag for a system call entry and system call exit. I think there was something similar in ProcFS. You can kind of get a stop mask back for an event. I think they're actually even the same bits. Uh, one other meth meth uh, field I'll mention is we have a PL uh, thread name. So in FreeBSD, we actually allow you to name the kernel threads. And there's like a, there's a non forward P thread wrapper for it. But for every time we request, we can actually get back the kernel based name that way, which we then later we use to actually send that to GDB so you can see your thread names in the debugger. Yes? Well, uh, well, yeah, it's the TID that you see in the kernel. So, yeah, all right. <laughs> no, like, so in my OS class, I had to teach the kids about kernel threads versus user threads, right? And nowadays, most operating systems just have a one-to-one -one match between you create a P thread and you get an LWP in the kernel. Most of us don't anymore do crazy M-to-N -end things like some of us used to. Um, so it all kind of, it's a little bit simpler. But it is the, the thread ID, what, what internally we call the thread ID, but to user land, it's more like an LWP ID. Um, GDB still has this notion of treating LWP separate from TIDs, although in, in, in GDB on FreeBSD, we basically treat them as one-to-one -one maps. So that was the LWP info structure and how we use it. So let's unwind back to how do we do fork following in FreeBSD? So a fully functional version of uh, interface for, for ptrace to handle this shipped in 9.1. I think Const Constantine implemented it because Juniper had patches for um, fork following to GDB. 
which I never saw, but that's fine. Um, we had a new ptrace op called PT Follow Fork. And it's kind of a request to say, I want you to enable fork following. And by enabling fork following, I want you to um, stop new child processes when they get created. And I want you to stop a process that's forking when it leaves the fork system call with a specific message saying it's handling a fork. Uh, the data argument passed with this can be used as a toggle, so you can either turn it on or off. Um, the, the fork following support in Ptrace also added some new fields and flags to that LWP info structure, which is how we're going to get information to detect a fork event in GDB when a, fork, when a stop happens. So we have a new PL flag fork flag. We set that in the parent process when it forks. We also have a PL flag child that gets set in the flags of a new child process when it forks. And finally, we have a PL child PID. When we have a, in the parent process, when we set PL flag fork, we will also set PL child PID to the PID of the process we just created. So with this, when a given thread stop happens, we can tell um, if a new process has shown up and it's a PID we don't know about and it has the child flag set, then we know, okay, we've got a new process. Um, or if we get a forked event, then we know that that process has just forked and we can find the PID of the process it just created. So how do we do this in GDB? So in the FreeBSD nat.c file, the native, the machine independent part of the native target, uh, added a new wait method specifically to handle waits that kind of overrides the generic ptrace wait method. And when a, we, so we call the, we actually call the kind of base class method, have it call wait and kind of transform the generic wait information into a more specific structure that FreeBS, that GDB knows about. Um, and GDB has these, well, I'll get to it in a second. And then once the parent base class has done that, it returns to my method. Um, and we look to see, did we stop because it was a trap? If we stop because of a signal or process exit, we're just gonna pass that along unchanged because that's already got enough detail in it for the debugger. But if we stop because of a trap, then we're gonna call, uh, the, we're gonna do the PT LWP info method from ptrace to get more details about why we stopped for a trap. In particular, we're gonna check those new flags we added to see if it was a fork event. Um, and then, depending on which kind of fork, we will either report to GDB, oh, we actually had a fork event or a vfork event. One little wrinkle about this, though, is that GDB can't usefully handle a fork until both processes are stopped. And both are ready to be manipulated by the debugger. So, when we get a given fork event, we look to see which process we are seeing now. Uh, if it's a child process, then we, well, if it's a child process, then the child is actually reporting the event before the parent, which will become obvious in a second. In that case, we actually, we have to wait for the parent to fork. Um, and the way I handle that is I have a little linked list of children that have forked, that have reported their fork, and their parent hasn't reported their fork yet, and I make a little structure and stick at the linked list, and I leave the child process stopped, and I go back and call wait again until the parent eventually shows up. Now eventually when the parent shows up, the parent's gonna report a forked event, and it's gonna give me the PID of the child process that it created. When I get that PID, I'm gonna go look at my linked list. If, if I already have an event there, I pull it out of the linked list, I know that I have both processes stopped, and I can construct my message to GDP telling it what kind of fork happened and the PID of the new child process. If I get the event and the child process hasn't stopped yet, it hasn't reported an event, I explicitly call wait on the PID of the child process. Because it's, it's, there's nothing for it to stop at except to tell me that it ran. So it's going to happen soon. So I explicitly wait for the child process, um, and, and which point that wait returns, I again have all the information I need, I can package it together and tell GDB about it. So that's, and so all that basically hand, happens inside the wait callback. And once I've reported the, the event correctly, the, GDB handles the rest of the details. All the bits for how it decides which one to pro which process to follow, and if you want to detach from one or the other, all that's machine independent. I don't have to manage any of that. I just have to report the event correctly, and my job is done. The last thing I had to do uh, was actually had to turn on following forks, and I just do it unconditionally. Um, either when you create a new process of run or you attach to an existing process, I just always turn this on. And that way I always get events, and it's up to GDB to decide based on the policy you've set with the different variables you have, what it wants to do with a given fork event when it happens.
Any questions about fork following on either the FreeBSD side or the GDB side? All right. All are an easy crowd. So the slightly more complicated one than fork following uh, is thread support. So we'll start with a bit of a history lesson and the wrinkles of dealing with open source politics. Um, so we've actually had a thread target for GDB, both in ports and in the base system for quite a while. However, that thread target was written by several people and it was written under a BSD license, which due to non-technical reasons cannot really be upstreamed to GDB, at least not without a lot of paperwork and lawyers and things I didn't want to do. Um, however, another, some other properties of this thread debug target. So it used the library we have in the base system called libthreadDB. And libthreadDB is a wrapper, sort of, or provides an interface for inspecting a thread library to query it for information about what threads are in a process. And in particular, it has quite a bit of complexity to handle thread libraries that do end-to-end -end mappings, where you might have more threads in user space than you have in user land. And it actually adds quite a bit of code to the target, because you have all these different hooks. Um, the way libthreadDB works is you will call into libthreadDB to do certain things, but then it calls back into you. So you have to create all these different global functions that you export to the library from yourself, where it calls back into you to fetch information in particular about LWPs. So it's kind of a lot of work to support and a little fat. Um, on the other hand, it does support all the different thread, li thread libraries FreeBSD has used in the past. Um, but because it's also this fixed interface, when you want to add support for some new feature or in particular a new register set, uh, such as uh, the XSAVE extensions that AVX uses, you have to go row to till this interface as well. So now you actually have several places to change. You have to rev the ThreadDB library perhaps depending on how your ptrace support is implemented. Um, and that just adds a lot more extra work. Some of the goals I had for getting threads into GDB 7 and modern GDB is I wanted something that we didn't have to maintain ourselves out of the tree. I wanted something that was upstream and that just lived up there. Um, turns out no one actually uses our older thread libraries anymore for the most part. Everyone really uses libthir, um, in which case there's a one-to-one -one mapping between threads you create in user space with pthread create and threads that live in the kernel and have LWPs. Um, I already mentioned that using libthreadDB requires a lot of code. Um, on the other hand, if we assume that we're only going to deal with processes that create one-to-one -one mappings and we're only going to deal with LWPs and kernel threads directly, that's actually quite a bit less code uh, to, to work with. One other odd quirk, um, oh, I guess I didn't mention, it's an odd quirk I may not have mentioned. Um, but one thing I won't mention, I didn't mention on the slides, the libthreadDB target also doesn't really do cross-debugging very well. Or at least it would require a lot more work to work right. So for example, if you're on MD64 and you want to debug a running i386 process, no threads. Right? No threads without a lot of work and a lot of work in all those different backends. So not only would you have to have, uh, the way libthreadDB is structured, it has backends for the different thread libraries that know how to go poke in all the structures and look at all the different things to walk the linked list and stuff for you. You would have to have duplicate copies of those that know about the different ABIs and the 32-bit KSC versus the 64-bit KSC and yada, yada, yada. Um, also, what about Linux processes that are running that are also using kernel threads? Well, then you'd have to have more libthreadDB backends that know how to talk to whatever libthread library your Linux processes are using, right? On the other hand, all these things, whether it's FreeBSD 32 binaries running under Compat or uh, more recent versions of FreeBSD, where the Linux later has been changed to actually use LWPs for threads inside of Linux processes, those all show up as LWPs. You can ptrace all of them. And so if you go the route you're just doing ptrace, you can now examine the threads of any process running without having to have OS-specific and thread library-specific hooks in libthreadDB. All right, I'm popping the stack a little bit. Um, one of the ways in which we have to write less code um, if we're going to use ptrace directly is one of the problems, or one of the features, as it were, when you're using a library like libkc, is when a user land thread is stopped in a state, then there is no ptrace request to get its registered. Instead, your thread library has saved a copy of the kind of m context structure that you would use with 
set in context and get in context somewhere. And you use libthreadDB to ask the thread library for a copy of that register set in the OS's native format. And it goes and digs around the, the structures and pulls it out. Um, but that means that the thread target, which I'm going to use chunk. Yeah. So remember my stack of targets when we were native? Our thread target actually has to know how to parse the struct reg, the, the, the structure we use of PT, get reg, and set reg for the, whatever architecture we're on. So in particular, normally the native target, you have a method that talks to ptrace that gets your register set and kind of turns it around and populates it in the structure that GDB expects. And that all lives down in one machine dependent file. I'm like md64 bsd nat.c or arm fbsd nat.c once we had that or something like that. It's one place, it's a static method private to that file. If the thread target is going to work with a user thread that's not currently running with LWP, then out of the thread library, it gets a copy of the struct reg, which is FreeBSD's specific structure. And it needs the same chunk of code that we use to translate the ptrace results up here, which means we have to have all these native targets have a local patch to export global functions up to this thing in every single architecture we want to support. Um, on the other hand, the handle LWPs, and, and the way it even did it was worse. So when your thread, your user thread actually is running on an LWP, so I should draw more pictures. This is our lib thread DB. And we'll call over here to say, like, give me my registers. And the lib thread DB goes and looks and says, well, and it's going to return a struct reg in the format that that is. It's either going to go find inside my threads kind of end user land control block and find a copy of struct reg that's going to return to me, or it's going to go, oh, you're running on an LWP. Okay, so the LWP, I'm going to call back over to this thing and say, give me the regs for an LWP. At which point we call down the two, well, yeah, we don't call down the ptrace. We duplicate the code <laughs> for ptrace in here. So we do ptrace again in here, machine dependent. Um, convert the, it's actually, it's, it's actually worse. <laughs> We don't duplicate the code. It would be nice, actually, if we did duplicate the code. We ask the thread library to call down and fetch the registers for a given LWP. But we ask for it in GDB format. We then convert the GDB format into struct reg to pass back to libthreadDB. libthreadDB turns around and copies the struct reg back to us so that we can convert it back into GDB format. And it turns out none of that bypass knows about AVX, for example. So. If we don't have a libthreadDB target, we just have an LWP ID come in that you pass to ptrace in the existing code, and it's like a little one-line change in the places that call pt get reg and set reg to call a little helper function that says, am I looking for a thread or a process? Pick the right number to pass to ptrace. And that's it, and all the different backends. And in fact, it turns out some of the architectures, for example, the Spark code is actually shared with like Solaris, ironically, and, and the BSDs already did that. So you have to patch that one. It just works. All right, enough ranting about that. So how do we actually use ptrace? Let's, you know, that we've decided we're not going to use libthreadDB. How do we use ptrace to directly ask um, FreeBSD about what LWPs are in the system? So first, we have this method. Uh, or an operation called get num LWPs. This gives us a simple count. All right. We have a get LWP list. Uh, you have to provide an array of a given length, and it populates them with the IDs of those threads. And it tells you how many you added. Um, in case the list got shorter, it'll give you a shorter count. But if it's bigger, I think, well, it stops because there's not more threads coming anyway. Um, then we already mentioned uh, PT get LWP info. Right, that was added initially, and we've already talked about that. Uh, one last little bit of things we have in ptrace is we have um, command suspend and resume. 
that you can give a specific thread ID so that you can mark an individual lightweight processor, LWP, to not run if you suspend it when you continue. Or you can take one that's been suspended previously and resume it so the next time you invoke PT continue or run again. So what that means is if you want to single step a single thread, you only want that thread to run. So the way you would implement that is GDB actually sends a request down saying, I want you to start running again, but I want you to run one thread. And so we lock the list of threads for our process. And we suspend all the threads that aren't our one thread. And we explicitly, in case it was suspended before, resume the one thread we're going to run. Then when we run PT continue, only the one thread is going to run. The next time we have to step it's over, GDB will send a request down to us saying, OK, let everything run. We'll lock the list. We'll resume all the different threads. We run PT continue, everything runs. So there's one more thing besides using ptrace to find out what threads are to stop and how we suspend and resume, which is we, we kind of need to know when threads come and go so we can update the list of threads. The way libthreadDB works is that one of the messages you could get back from libthreadDB are the addresses of two special functions, little helper functions, from each thread library, depending on what thread library you're attached to, where we could manually set kind of hidden breakpoints inside of GDB to stop that. So if you go look in like libthir or any of the thread libraries, when they do thread create, they do something kind of ridiculous like this. You kind of have like a thread create event. It's a null function, doesn't do anything. And at the end of pthread create, we call this. We call this so that when you're using libthreadDB, we can put a breakpoint on this. And that's how we find out that threads get created. And we do the same thing for thread exit. So we do extra work just so we can put a breakpoint in your user line code. Um, and that's how libthreadDB worked to do this. So one way we could do this, uh, when we're not, if we're not using libthreadDB, then we no longer get these messages about this. Also, again, if we want to support um, stops on libraries libthreadDB doesn't know about, then we have no way to get these stops. So one option is every time um, ptrace stops, um, sorry, the process stops to report an event, we can just go scan the list every time to see what's changed. And that's fine, you can do that. But it does mean you're going to have to call ptrace two or three times every single time something happens, just in case any threads happen to start or exit. So something I added to ptrace in FreeBSD 11 is a way to ask the kernel to give you events when the LWP is start and exit. So I add a new little uh, operation called PT LWP events. It's kind of like PT follow fork. It's a toggle to allow you to turn this feature on or off. When that is, uh, okay, in a second, uh, I'll guess. When it is turned on, uh, back up. So I added the, event, the new operation, and then I added two more flags to that LWP info structure that we can query. Um, there's a new flag born, which means on a brand new thread, I've just started, and this is my very first stop. Um, we've actually, one thing I had to change is I had to fix the kernel to actually stop a thread on the way out. Um, unfortunately, it would have been handy if we had had a system call exit event on the way out because then I could have possibly only trapped system call exit events to know about new threads, but we didn't stop it at all. It just went and ran all the way out to the kernel through the back door. Now it does not. It will stop on the way out to report a born event. Um, and when a thread goes into the kernel to call exit, we will actually stop right before we really exit so we can report a new exited event to user land to say, I, I'm going away now. I mentioned a little bit that when a thread's created on the way out to return to user land, um, yeah, we added a stop now that will always stop, and it'll report this birth event. One thing to note is we don't report a birth event for the brand new process because we're already reporting a fork event if you care. So we only do this when you create more threads, not when you create the first thread because that's redundant. You already know about the first thread. That happens through fork or because you've attached or you've called run or something like that. Similarly, kind of, um, I mentioned that exiting threads can report an event when they go away for exiting, but we don't have to do that for the last thread. The last thread to go out the door is going to call exit and wait tells us about exit already. So we don't have, well, you do not need an explicit event for the final thread 
only for threads that aren't the last thread. In particular, um, it does do the right thing, which is if something goes haywire in a multi-threaded process and we have to internally unwind threads, um, or for example, you call exec, and the thread that calls exec keeps going and all the other threads go away, all those threads, when they go away internally in the kernel, not by calling pthread exit, they actually report an exit event correctly. So, how does the, the target work in GDB? We, how do we pull this stuff together? So, we enumerate LWPs explicitly and we treat those as threads. So we walk the list of LWPs when we need to or when an event comes in, we add, we update the list and that's, we tell GDB each LWP is a thread. That is what you know with a thread. We don't try to do anything beyond that. Uh, the only change we have to make to platform specific targets is this little helper method that to decide which value of PID we're gonna pass to PT get regs and PT set regs. It does the right thing based on the request GDB has sent down um, if it's a brand new process that we don't know the LWP ID yet, it passes the PID. Otherwise, we're always going to pass the thread ID to fetch the thread specific registers. And then, as I kind of mentioned previously, we use resume and suspend to handle requests from GDB to only run a subset of threads. So one more last tangent in user land. So it turns out, I know Ptrace folks like Ptrust. We still have trust in FreeBSD. Um, and trust has had um, a varying level of quality um, in the past, but hopefully the level of quality is a little better in 11. Um, in particular, I fixed trust to make use of both of these features internally. It used to be if you, you could ask trust to follow forks, and what happened is when a child process forked, trust would fork a new process to try to find the new child but it had to kind of go and attach to it and you lost whatever events it didn't see until it called attach on the new child process. Oh well, that's life. Um, and also it now uses PTB, PTB, PTLWP, so back up for a second. Now Trust uses PT follow fork and it has a single process that can monitor a whole tree. Um, so when a new process gets created, we get the fork events, we actually output a new line to say, hey, we've got a new child process, it's got this PID, and now that one trust process stays attached as a debugger to both processes that are being traced and will handle events from any of them as they come in. It also uses the LWP events extension. Um, it can report, it actually outputs a little line saying when threads exit and when they come. Um, and one, it probably no one else remember but me cares, one of the things about trust is if a multi-threaded process is called exit, you didn't know which process called exit or which thread called exit. That the exit that counted for real. So if multiple threads could call exit, but one of them would win the race, the rest of them we would kill. In particular, only the value passed to the real thread that called exit is the return value of the process, if you're being really pedantic. Uh, now, because I in trust know exactly which thread called exit, and I have remembered at the start of the system call, what arguments were passed to exit, I can print out a line when a process exits that actually tells you a line for exit. Previously, we just didn't list the exit event at all. Now you get a little one line of exit with the value passed to it with no return value. No one else cares, but I think it's kind of neat. All right, so that's the user land portion of the talk. All right, no other, any questions? <laughs> that thing up there above the libc interface. Um, so the rest of the time, I want to talk about, uh, well, do we have any time? Okay, we'll go really quick. So, kernel debugging. <laughs> I don't do Robert Watson very well. Um, so, I hacked on libkvm a bit um, to add cross debugging. So libkvm is a library that gives you a nice interface to talk to crash dumps. In particular, uh, you're able to basically plug in a kernel virtual address and a size and it gives you back a block with the right things, which is very useful if you're a debugger. Previously, uh, libkvm only knew how to parse a crash dump for the architecture you were running on. So if you're on a big fancy honking AMD64 box, you can look at an AMD64 crash dump, that's great, but you can't look at your Raspberry Pi's crash dump, you have to run KGDB on the Raspberry Pi to look at the Raspberry Pi's crash dump. Mm, that's not very quick. So, things I changed in libkvm. First of all, I added a new little type I call kvadder t to represent virtual addresses. Previously, libkvm used a, a long, 
which when you're running, if you want to actually use a 32-bit host to debug a 64-bit target, you can't address all the kernel virtual addresses. KV adder T is always 64 bits, so we can hold any address for any architecture we currently support. In addition, I added a kind of wrapper around struct endless. So one of the things KVM, libkvm gives you is a way to map uh, symbol names to addresses, but that has the same long problem. So because struct endless embeds a long for the address it returns to you. So the little struct kvm list, it looks very similar, except that the in value member uses kv adder t instead of long, so you can always get back a full pointer. Ah. Went too far. For the API changes, there's not many of them. There's yet another wrapper for KVM open because two wasn't enough. Um, we have a KVM open two that looks just like KVM open, but it has an additional parameter. In particular, libkvm internally calls this libc method to try to resolve, um, to try to use like parse an elf file, a native elf file, to parse symbols to addresses using the symbol table. And that only works on a native binary. It does not work when cross-debugging. So the extra function, which is optional to KVM open 2, is you can give libkvm an explicit function to call when you want to resolve a name to an address. And debuggers know how to do this using the debug symbols. Um, uh, and if you don't supply it, then we just fall back to only using the native method, and we won't allow you to open a cross-debug, a, a cross-architecture uh, crash jump. We'll sell that request. Then we have an alternate to KVM read called KVM read 2 because I was trying to keep ABI compatibility. Um, it is just like KVM read except that it uses the KV adder type for the virtual address that you take in so that it can always handle any kernel virtual address. The one other change in terms of the back end of KVM is now we need to teach KVM how to read all the different core formats, we, the different crash formats we have, all the different architectures we have in FreeBSD. So I have this, I've named it after the little macro you instantiate to add an object to a linker set. It's also a linker set. Uh, but in effect, we have now multiple little backends, multiple crash dump readers inside of libkvm. And you can add whatever kind of architecture you want to do. And for example, before we had some kind of, it was somewhat hackish, how we would handle the different formats of core dumps we have on some architectures. So architectures that support mini dumps um, also oftentimes support a full memory dump for legacy reasons. And so there would be if statements in a couple of different places to try to flip between which one it was. Now they're actually treated as separate backends and separate objects with their own methods. Uh, one issue though when you're writing these backends, uh, and, and kind of a general issue with cross debugging, is you can't just use the native constants from your machine header files anymore. Right? Page size tells you your host page size. It does not tell you your target page size. Uh, so the back ends all have to be changed to use explicit constants for their back end. Um, for the different layouts, the structures in particular, um, the full dumps like to walk the page tables explicitly, even the mini dumps store a kind of modified version of page table entries. So we need constants that are machine independent in terms of when they're compiled, they're always correct and right for the layout of, these, of our page tables or other structures that we need um, in the different fields inside of them. And part of the way I try to keep myself honest is that when you're compiling a given backend natively, there are a whole bunch of static asserts to make sure everything lines up so I didn't break anything. Uh, then for the different backends, uh, each one includes a kind of a probe function to basically look at a given crash dump to see if it knows how to handle that crash dump. I uh, use libelf to, to handle reading the elf specific bits. Um, extracting the architecture that ELF claims it's for, for example. Uh, and then we have the, the backend in addition to the probe function have one other function, which is given a virtual address, uh, give me, it turns out to be the offset in the, in the core dump where that virtual address lives and how much data comes after it that is all virtually contiguous in kernel virtual address space. And that is what KVM read uses in the backend. It takes in a virtual address now it talks to the back and it says, okay, I've got a virtual address. Go tell me where in the core dump file that virtual address lives and how much stuff is there. Then it can go seek out to the core dump file, read that chunk. If it's got all it's needed, it's done. If it's not, then it gets the next range of virtual addresses it needs and goes and calls the callback again. All right. Well, we are not going to get through all this. <laughs> so I will the slides are up, by the way. <laughs> 
So y'all just tell me when you want to stop. Um, so I want to talk about what all do you have to add to GDB to make it into KGDB. So in the rough outline, we need a new type of target that knows how to talk to a crash dump. Uh, and also, uh, because libkvm can talk to devmem directly, it actually kind of does double duty for debugging a live kernel on the machine or examining a crash dump from the machine. So that's the target, that in, and GDB is called VM Core, and it lives in this fbsd kvm.c file. Uh, it also has a couple of helper commands, proc and tid, to allow you to use the FreeBSD kernel's native identifiers to switch your thread around instead of having to do info threads and figure out what random number GDB assigned to your thread to switch to. Um, this target also has a helper file that it uses that walks the list of all the processes and all the threads in the processes that is used to enumerate the threads and, and processes in your core dump, and the VM core target uses that. When we're doing remote debugging over serial or some other serial method, um, we actually do not use this file. The little GDB stub inside of the FreeBSD kernel already has a method to tell GDB directly what threads are present. So this is only used when we're enumerating crash dumps or devmem. The reason previously when I talked about ABIs being able to have their own hook for shared library targets um, is for a kernel, we actually create a new set of shared library routines that we map onto kernel modules. So when you're debugging a kernel in FreeBSD under KGDB, uh, we actually take all your list of kernel modules and present them to GDB as if that's the shared library that your running process is using. So you can use GDB's commands for managing shared libraries, for example, loading, unloading symbols for shared libraries um, on kernel modules. Uh, and then to make cross-debugging kind of work and to allow us to hook in some of these things, I've actually taught GDB to think of kernels as a separate type of ABI from user land binaries just to kind of easier to make it work that way. So when you pull up an ELF binary in KGDB, um, it sees it's a FreeBSD ELF binary, then it goes and actually looks to see what the path we're using for RTLD. Because we kind of have this hack that Peter put in the build system long ago that now can never be removed. You did it, Doug did it, now <laughs> even better. Um, to use the string red herring for the name of the runtime linker, because you can't actually run it with a real one, and so I look for that. If I see that, I know I'm looking at a, a file for a kernel instead of a file for a user land binary. Uh, in which case, I actually pick a different ABI, a different GDB arc to use. Uh, say what? On x86 they do, it's in my. It's in the link command. Because we actually link the kernel as a shared object so that we can use it for KLDs. And it's in the LD command to make it shared with hack.so that we do this. You don't do red herring? No, no we don't have that. Then we'll have to figure out some other way to differentiate kernels from non kernels. Um, in particular, that's how I can auto hook in the KLD stuff correctly. Right, where was I going? All right. So that was kind of the machine independent bits, I think. Uh, oh boy, let's go too fast. So what are things we have to do for each architecture? Um, what are things we have to do that are not machine independent, like that VM core target was machine independent? What are things we have to do for each ABI we want to support, or each platform? Uh, one thing we need are special unwinders to handle the unique kind of frames, stack frames you have in kernel code. In particular, kind of analogous to signal frames in user land, we have frames when a fault or exception is raised, what FreeBSD tends to call trap frames. So we need a special unwinder for each platform that knows how to walk across a trap frame and how to pull all the registers out of a trap frame. So every architecture needs that. Um, sometimes we need more than one. So on i386, for example, when we get a double fault, it's not actually a trap frame. We do a, a more convoluted and complicated mess involving a TSC, TSS switch. So you have another unwinder to deal with that problem. One of the things we need in each process, in each architecture's back end, uh, we need a, it says a process, it's really a, a hook to manage the thread control block, which we still call a PCB, so that when a given thread is stopped uh, in a crash dump, for example, and we know it's currently stopped, it was on the run queue, we need a way to get the initial set of registers out of that thread that we can then use to start our stack unwinding process. And that is machine dependent. And the VM core target 
uh, uh, requires the MD code for each platform to provide a hook that it can call. Uh, it's actually a GDB arc method uh, to give, given a PCB, populate the registers for that PCB. Um, in the GDB or the KGDB branch, the naming convention I use is that I, instead of like dash tdep.c or .nat.c, I use foo fbsd-kern.c. Each of these files defines an ABI for a given kernel platform architecture. Um, in particular, they explicitly use the KLD shared object hooks uh, to enumerate uh, modules, kernel modules. They explicitly add these custom and winders. So when we actually only use these custom and winders on kernels, not userland binaries. And they register these hooks for how do we take a PCB and turn it into a set of registers for a given thread. And that's where they add that hook in there. So what is on the schedule? It's already 2.31. Do we have a break or are you all supposed to all be in another talk? We got 10 minutes? <sighs> all right. <laughs> Y'all are the sleep or something. Um, so that's a little bit about GDB, but cross debugging. So cross debugging is a little more complex than when you're not cross debugging. So for example, the KGDB and base would do things like, I'll just declare a struct proc P on the stack, and I'll KVM read my struct proc as I'm walking the process list. And then when I want to find the address of the next process, I'll just look at p underscore list at la next, and that's the virtual address of the next process, and off I go. Well, that's fine if you're debugging native and your struct proc exactly matches that of the kernel. It's not so great if you're debugging some other random architecture that might have a different pointer size or a different endianness or just somebody added a field to struct proc. Um, so, one thing we can do with GDB, because GDB has this abstraction for different ABIs and architectures, we can ask it for some of these things. You can ask the architecture, how big are your pointers? What Indianness do you have? And in particular, GDB gives you some nice helper methods to say, here's a virtual, or here's a chunk of memory, that's a pointer to like an array of bytes. Um, and given this architecture that has this Indianness, go decode this into an integer of so much size. For example, here's an array of four bytes because I've asked you for the pointer size and I've read the four bytes and it says, turn that into a native uh, integer for my host. And so you can use that to decode pointers, for example, into your native format so you can get an address assuming you read from the right place. But this does mean that now you can't just depend on the compiler to handle structure layout for you by declaring struct proc and copying the whole thing. Um, you need to explicitly handle the fact that for the, the layout of the structures you're inspecting are going to vary depending on what core number platform or architecture lo you're looking at. So one way you can do this, because I haven't figured out the best way to directly ask GDB, unfortunately, um, but this would be similar to using CTF kind of to query similar things, is we can use the debug symbols to figure this out if we have them. So the way I currently do this is I basically generate a string that is the, the, a manually expanded offset of for the fields that I care about. And I ask GDB to evaluate the string. Uh, in which case, if it has debug symbols, that's going to work. And it's going to give me the offset of these different fields inside the, inside the struct proc. But I also wanted to try to make it work as well as I could um, on kernels that perhaps didn't have debug symbols. So recent kernels, it's been, in, I think even 10.3 shipped with this. 11.0 certainly will ship with it. I've defined some global static integers, more or less, to define some of the things that I need at least to be able to walk the processes and threads in the system. So I have these global variables laid out that basically just say the offset of various fields in struct proc and struct thread, with a big XXX comment, do not delete this above it. Okay, um, and so KGDB will actually look for these first, and if it can't find them in an extractive value, then it resorts to the hack of using manual offset of the debug symbols. So then what does it look like in code to actually use one of these things? And believe me, this is the, the shortest bit I could extract from this. So um, we can ask, the, at the top what we're doing is we're saying, for our given architecture, our GDB arc, tell me what you use for a data pointer. Like what's the abstract type that describes a pointer on your architecture that points to data as opposed to pointing to code? Uh, and then uh, for your architecture, what endianness are you using or what GDB calls byte order? I'm going to save those. Um, then this is the bit, what am I reading? The address of a struct 
That's actually not, oh, yeah. So I start off coming into this little bit of code. I have the virtual address of a given struct proc, so a, a process structure in p adder, a native format. And I'm going to read a couple of things. So in this case, I want to read um, p underscore threads, which was the head of the linked list of threads that lives inside a process. And so if I, the pointer value stored that offset is actually the pointer to the first thread in the process. So I ask it, I tell GDB, I want you to read an address. It's at this virtual address, which is the address of my process, and explicitly add the offset of p threads. Uh, and it's my pointer type. And, and GDB, in this method, is smart enough to figure out the endingness and everything else from the pointer type, read an address, and return it to me in native format. So now my thread adder points to is the, virtual, the kernel virtual address of the first thread in the associated process. Um, but I also want some things besides pointers. And so PID is an example of reading an integer. Uh, now I know that PIDs on all our architectures are stored as a 32-bit integer, because they are. So I do something a little similar. I tell it I want to read an integer out of memory. The address I want you to use is the process, the address of my struct proc and the offset of PPID. The integer is four bytes long, and it has the endingness that I had gotten out of my GDB architecture earlier. And that's going to do the right thing. It's going to read the four bytes um, out of memory for me. So it's actually going to ask the target to read four bytes of memory into a temporary buffer. And then it's going to parse in the endingness it needs and decode it and return a native byte order PID to me. That's how I can find the PID. Yes? Well, not for the PID. That's P adder. Uh, so TD adder in this case points to the first thread in the process. In, if I could write the equivalent in C, if you were doing this natively. And PID, of course, is basically equivalent to like that. Um, so pnext is kind of similar um, to reading the thread address, except in this case we're reading plist, which is actually like list next. So I kind of cheat and know the fact that really it's p underscore list at le next, but it's all in the same address as plist. So I just use I, assuming that the first thing in a list next is actually the next pointer and not adding an additional offset to plist. So that's what you have to do for things like the thread enumerator. You have to do some similar things in other places in the, uh, in, in the different, in KGDB. So for example, in the machine dependent code where we have uh, this hook to parse a PCB, um, where we're going to unwind trap frames, now we have to do some similar things to handle the fact that uh, knowing how that layout exists. Uh, in the native GDB, KGDB, for example, We'll do things like just assume that offset of trap frame comma tfrax, and that's the offset of rax, and we're done. I mean, we can't do that if we're not compiling on AMD64, for example. The way GDB gets around this for user land debugging is it requires each platform to explicitly give a little array of offsets of your struct reg. And so I use the same approach. You have to explicitly define um, some little array or some similar helper to describe the layout of your struct trap frame or your struct PCB so that it can then fetch the registers out that it needs. And when it's fetching register values out, it has to do some similar shenanigans to handle the fact that if I'm reading from a PCB or I'm reading from a trap frame, I need to handle anyness, I need to know how big it is, things like that. One more thing that I had to do, uh, you can look in the code for the CPU stop method in the GDB imports. Um, but when we have a crash dump and some of the processes where the threads are running, uh, we can't look in those thread structure to find the PCB because the PCB represents the register state the last time that thread stopped. But while thread's running, we don't update the PCB constantly because that would be crazy. Um, instead, when a kernel crashes, the thread that actually crashed, we save its PCB in a global variable that we know how to get to. All the other threads that are running, we send an IPI to their CPUs to stop them, and as part of that IPI handler, they dump their current thread state and so a global array called stop PC, stopped 
uh, or stop PCBs. When we're running a thread, when we're, when we're sorry, when we're running KGDB and we want to find out, we want to parse the state of a given thread, we need to check to see was this a thread that was currently running, and if so, I need to go fetch its state out of that global array rather than trying to look inside the thread structure itself. Um, and as part of the step for validating that everything is correct because of the order of operations that happen, we actually need to check this stop CPU's CPU set um, inside of KGDB to know if we should look in the array. And the way that CPU sets are implemented on FreeBSD is an array of longs. And so I don't get to call CPU is set directly. I basically have to explicitly duplicate the logic using all the kind of convoluted read a memory in my byte order, yada, yada, yada stuff. And that's all in that method if you're curious. Do I have to stop? All right. Y'all can read the slides. There are only three left. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs>